are good. Okay. Go ahead and um, start the recording. I did. Okay. Thank you, sweetheart. Uh, again, brothers and sisters in Christ, we want to say welcome to uh, our book of the of, uh, of Hebrews, our study of this great book uh, in the New Testament. This is week number two. Uh, last week we did a, an overview and an introduction. Tonight I want to uh, focus on chapter one. There's going to be some bleed over in some of these chapters. They don't end specifically at the end of the book, uh, end of a particular chapter. Sometimes it'll go three or four chapter verses into the next chapter, thus is, uh, the, there, thereby. But, uh, but for our own understanding, I'm going to try to keep it um, uh, by chapter. That way it kind of helps uh, us to mentally know where we are and what we have, have left to do uh, going forward. Uh, so, so, so right out of the, 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 the bat, the writer, and we talked about Paul being the writer, but, uh, but the writer just goes into a series of statements, uh, without, uh, any, uh, salutation. He, he does not identify himself. Uh, in these opening uh, verses, he just says, God at sundry times, in various times, uh, in various ways or divers ways and manners, spoke to us and spoke to our fathers uh, by the prophets that in those days, uh, God sp speak or spoke to us by his son, uh, referring to him, you know, Jesus Christ, whom he had appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Uh, and we can kind of match some of what being said here by Paul with John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And so he just makes the statement um, uh, declaring that, I know you have a faith in God. I know that you know the Son of God. But I want to combine or, or uh, draw a correlation between, you know, what God has done for us and, oh my, how did I lose that? What God has done for us and certainly uh, uh, through his son, Jesus Christ, going forward. So, uh, he, he identifies his son, not saying Christ Jesus, but he says his son. And so he dispenses with any greetings, uh, any of the niceties, certainly John, uh, uh, Paul rather, has a particular way of addressing uh, his, his particular uh, epistles. And uh, in the midst of those things, uh, I'm trying to multitask here, and I'm finding that I, I've lost the skill to do that. Good Lord, how did this happen? Uh, <laughs> you know how things work the first time when you do it, and no, no issues. But now that you <laughs> in front of folks, oh great! How did this get like that? Okay. Uh, so it dispenses with uh, Paul's normal manner in which he makes greetings and salutations. Uh, and uh, instead of reading like a letter, uh, Paul does become a little preachy or, or, or uh, gives it as a sermon going forward. And because he, he wants to uh, grab their attention and talk from a, a doctrinal standpoint. He, he, he is not uh, trying to persuade them in, in some of the letters, certainly to the Corinthians uh, and Ephesians, where he is uh, more or less uh, giving uh, um, uh, uh, subtle teachings. Uh, 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 but here his purpose is to get their attention, turn them uh, back to Jesus Christ, by presenting uh, facts, um, uh, spiritual uh, uh, references, 
Uh, he's going to be pulling in some Old Testament scriptures uh, as a means and a method of uh, regaining uh, their trust to, to at least listen to him and then to retrust Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And he wants to present Jesus as a superior uh, uh, um, uh, gift from God, better than anything else that you're going to be confronted by uh, or anything else you might put in his place. Jesus is going to prove himself better than all of that that he is superior to our prophets as spokespersons. And we see that in these first three verses of chapter one, uh, who being the brightness uh, of God's glory, as well as the expression of the image of God's person. Uh, and Jesus is, uh, that's the first half of, of, of this particular uh, chapter, the first three verses of chapter one. And then, verses 4 through 14 of this chapter 1, he talks about Jesus being superior to, over the angels uh, by virtue of his deity, uh, that angels were messengers, they were just ministering spirits that the Lord had has, has used to interact with human beings, while his son, Jesus Christ, uh, is, is, is both creator and ruler of all that has been created. He is the creator of what is created and the ruler of what has been created. So, so the first uh, thing we wanna see is that Jesus is superior to the angels, uh, certainly more than what the prophets could have done. Uh, let me see if I can re regain this. I don't know why this, this thing is doing this like this. Um, and uh, it ain't gonna let me do it. Okay. So, so while God spoke in times past by the fathers or the prophets, or, or to the fathers rather, by the prophets, he is now going to speak to us through his son. And so, uh, uh, Paul has, has, uh, uh, has interacted with uh, some of these who are in the audience. Um, and again, if, you, if you're believing that, well, uh, for some reason, I can't get this thing to give me the, uh, to give me the, uh, I was trying to pull up my version of, of the uh, of Hebrews on there. But then it then it got got to a place where I couldn't do that. Uh, so so because we believe that it was written from Jerusalem as opposed to being written to the to the to the Hebrews in Rome, uh, then Paul would have known some of these who are in this congregation. I just need Hebrews chapter one, and uh, so he is making the argument that uh, in times past that God spoke to our fathers. Yes, ma'am. He has spoken to our fathers through prophets, but that now God has given us his own son to lead God and direct us. So he's going to establish that in the first three verses before he gets to the angels. Thank you, baby. Um, and so Jesus Christ, the son of God, is ministering to us. He's going to give us four specific areas, and I hope you've got the handout. Um, uh, that's, that's out on our webpage, so you can kind of stay ahead of me uh, or stay up with me. Uh, he's he's going to give it to us via uh, the revelation, creation. He's going to talk about presentation and purification. That revelation that in the Old Testament God reveals uh, through his message, but rather, but now in the New Testament, God is making revelation or he's going to reveal uh, his message through the Messiah. Uh, Old Testament was through the messengers. In the New Testament, God reveals through his Messiah or through the Messiah. 
And so that's the revelation that God is using to open up our minds, to transform our, our thoughts going forward. Jesus is better than uh, what the prophets were able to do. Not only that, but creation, uh, the Son made the universe. Now the Son maintains uh, the universe. We see that in Genesis 1. We see that in John chapter 1, where, uh, where let there be. Uh, light. Uh, God is uh, saying that, but Jesus is the action of God that goes out and creates the universe. And we see that in John chapter 1, verses, verse 3, that all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So, so Jesus is the creative force of God's thoughts, um, as well as God's revelation, his, his, his final message to his people. And, uh, and, and therefore, Jesus is the representation of who God is. Uh, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and am, I and the Father are one. So Jesus represents God's being. He's not, he's not um, uh, uh, likened unto man, made under the image of, made in the image of man. Uh, made likened unto the image uh, of, through a woman, but he still bears the, uh, the, 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 the internal spiritual uh, uh, resemblance of God himself. He is God the Son, as God the Father and God the Holy Spirit are themselves part of the Godhead. And then this word purification that Jesus is uh, presents this important aspect for us in that Jesus died to cleanse us from our sins. And uh, Paul's will say that later on uh, when he talks about the sacrifice of Christ, that what the blood of bulls and goats could not do, sheep's could, blood could not do, uh, Jesus Christ has accomplished for us. And so in verses two through two and three, there are seven things that describe the son for us in his uh, writing. Uh, the, the text says that in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. I want you to catch on these either nouns or verbs as, as they are coming up under King James. Uh, verse 2 uh, of chapter 1, I'm looking at it, uh, appointed heir, uh, he made worlds, uh, who being in the brightness or the, uh, the glory of God, expressed um, image of his person, and uphold all things by the word of his power, when he had but I'm sorry, when he had by himself purged or purified our sins, and then finally uh, uh, he sat down at the right hand of God. Those seven things, we want to talk about them. That Jesus is appointed heir of all things. So what was lost in the first Adam is restored in the last Adam. Paul says this to us out of 1 Corinthians 1545. Uh, Secondly, uh, that through Christ, God made the worlds. And that's when I was saying that uh, Jesus is the, uh, is the action of God's thoughts. Uh, God uh, said, let there be light. Jesus uh, produces light and then comes on the scene and says, I am the light of the world. Um, uh, John recognizes uh, Jesus Christ, full of uh, grace and truth, uh, declares that all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And that's out of John chapter 1, verse 3. So he made the worlds. He is heir of all things. Uh, thirdly, that he is the brightness of God's glory. That is, the Son of God eternally conveys the glory, the majesty, and the power of God from eternity past to and through, well, well, well through this current age, all the way to and through eternity future. Um, uh, he that has no beginning has no end. 
that's the that's that's the uh, the, the impression. I'm sorry, the the expression that uh, Paul is going to say concerning Melchizedek. He has no beginning, has no end. So is Jesus Christ, uh, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Having, having uh, the his existence uh, uh, in all all reference to mankind, to, to man's time. Amen. Before there was a when or where. Okay, eternity past before the garden, as well as eternity future on the other side of the eternal state that we saw in Revelation 22. Okay. <clears throat> uh, fourthly, that uh, Jesus is the express image of God's person, that uh, Jesus the Son is completely the same in his being as God the Father. Uh, we catch some of that out of Philippians chapter 2, uh, that uh, the, the mind that was in God, uh, that, was, that was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal to God, uh, uh, in, in his essence, uh, because he is God, uh, in, in essence, uh, and, um, and, uh, what we, what we, uh, understand is that he took on humanity, but Jesus taking on human form did not diminish his God night, his Godness, uh, his, his image of God. Uh, and he didn't. He 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 never ceased being God. Okay, uh, you'll find uh, in theology there's an argument that Jesus becomes Christ uh, just before he goes. Uh, he he becomes Christ at baptism, and he ceased to become Christ just before he goes to the to the to the cross, so that uh, he can die because you can't kill God. Well, again, that's an argument that uh, that I think most Bible verses will dispute. You know, you just you, you know, I, I don't believe that, but but there are those who will will say that. But I believe God can do whatever He wants to do. So if God wants to die, and and if God wants to fully uh, appreciate uh, human life and 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 suffer uh, as we have suffered. Uh, to know, become sin in our stead, to be tempted in all ways as we were tempted, yet sin not, then the only way he's going to do that is, is fully appreciate that. And then to say that, you know, once he's done all that and he does not die, then, then you and I might have an argument on judgment and say, wait a minute, God, you don't know how it is down here, you know. You didn't go all the way to death. But Jesus is God, and he went all the way to death, through death, conquered death, got up from the, from the dead, and uh, promised that he will get us up as well. So he is the image of God. Don't, don't, don't let nobody tell you otherwise. Amen. Uh, 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 going forward. Um, superior to angels. We're, we're talking about his superiority, uh, that he upholds all things by the word of his power. Uh, that is, Jesus upholds the world, not by physical strength, but by his almighty word. The word has power. There's power before heaven and earth may pass away, but not one jot or tittle shall in no wise uh, fall from the law. The law is been, has been fulfilled uh, in Christ Jesus, and the basis and the foundation of lo uh, law is love. God is love. The first nature of God is God. God is love. And Jesus brings that first nature aspect to us that he so loved the world, that God so loved the world, that Jesus too also loved the world, that he died. God gave Jesus to us. Jesus gave himself to us. And therefore his word that we can stand on it. Amen. We can trust it. It, it will not fail us, not only in application, but it will not fail us in 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 truth, uh, as well as in its uh, promises of, uh, 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 for us going forward. Uh, so we're talking about Christ. We're talking about the Son of God. Not only that, but He purged our sins. This is the purification aspect that uh, what had been poisoned by sin was cured 
or purified by the blood of Jesus forever, once and for all, uh, never to be, re be repeated. Yom Kippur was an annual event every 360 days, because there's only 360 days in, in a Jewish uh, year. Uh, and so every year they had to go back through that process and, uh, and uh, another animal had to sacrifice its life uh, in place of uh, the, the, the innocent for the guilty. But Jesus did that once and for all. He that was innocent died for the guilty and that we are made and forever made a uh, whole, purged from uh, the poison, if you will, of, of sin in our lives. And then finally, uh, having done all that, he sat down, uh, his seated at the right hand of God, the majesty on high. Uh, no exalted saint or powerful angel can sit at the right hand of the Father to receive the praise, nor the glory, but the Son, Jesus Christ, who is the perfect Lamb of God. Right out of Revelation 5.13, worthy is the Lamb. We're going to see it. We're going to say it. We're going to celebrate it, amen, and we're going to shout hallelujah at the end of all of that. And so what the Hebrew writer is saying to us that God spoke in the Old Testament by prophets, but in the New Testament, this new covenant of love and grace, uh, Jesus Christ did the talking uh, for three and a half years, convincing his uh, disciples and those that would listen uh, that God is, is giving us a new covenant, a new relationship based on love and his unmerited favor of grace. He's more superior than the angels because they'll say, well, wait a minute. And so what, so what uh, Paul does here is what he also does in the book of Romans, because um, we have oftentimes stated that in the book of Romans, uh, the, the, the image of Paul's uh, talking is as a lawyer standing before uh, divine providence. Uh, divine providence is the judge in a court. The scene is a courtroom. Uh, divine providence is the judge. And divine providence is saying that the guilty has to die. He's invoking uh, e Ezekiel, uh, the soul that sinneth must surely die. Uh, but then, uh, um, uh, uh, Paul stands up uh, under the authority of the Holy Spirit, and he advocates for us uh, that 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 Jesus uh, uh, was our defense lawyer, and he defended us a long time ago. Okay, and even though we might be uh, we're being uh, 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 tried again. Uh, Paul stands up, and he's not making a new argument. He's just telling you what Jesus has done for us, okay, that, uh, that all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but the grace of God is eternal life through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so he is presenting the argument on behalf of Jesus Christ and what he has accomplished on our, uh, on our, behalf, on our behalf and for our benefit. Same thing here. He's going to argue that he's better than the, uh, the angels, he's, he's better than Moses. Uh, and so he is anticipating the, the, the audience or the readers or the listeners, however you want to couch the people, um, he's anticipating their, their, their objections to, 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 to stay in with Jesus Christ. And, 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 and Paul is trying to uh, circumvent their argument or their objections by saying, well, I know you know about angels, but let me tell you, you know, as much as you, you like uh, uh, Michael and Gabriel and stuff like that, uh, Jesus is better than Gabriel, okay? And I know you like Moses, Jesus is better than Moses. I know you like Aaron, uh, and, and you understand the Levitical laws, and you all have lived your life under those Levitical laws before you came to Christ. But let me tell you, Jesus is better than, 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 than Aaron and the Levitical law. I know you like Joshua and what Joshua did for us, and he divided the land for us and brought us into the promised land so we can rest. But let me tell you something, Jesus is better than Joshua. And so he's going to 
uh, argue for Jesus Christ by, by dismantling any uh, counter argument that they might present uh, as to their reasons why they want to leave Christianity. Okay. Uh, so here's five ways that Jesus is better than the angels. And he takes this all the way through, through the chapter, chapter one. This, we we, we kind of close it out here. Um, first of all, he says that Jesus is the, is the son, uh, uh, that is the son of God, and angels are not God's son. They are created being Jesus uh, existed. Only thing that God had to do for, or the Holy Spirit did for, 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 for Jesus, uh, was uh, to to implant him into the womb of Mary. Okay, and so so Jesus uh, uh, comes into the world through uh, the, the the Virgin. Okay. But angels are created beings, uh, more so like uh, the first Adam. You know, remember Adam and Eve were created, but then through procreation uh, was Cain, Abel, and Seth, the first three uh, coming forward. Cain killed Abel, and then Seth was a replacement uh, going forward. Um, and so angels cannot do what the Son of God has done. And so the Son is, you know, so God has highly exalted the Son of God, his Son, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Uh, and so, and so, even though in this text a little, little later they're going to say has made Jesus a little lower than the angels, out of Psalms eight, uh, where I think we says that well, who, what is man that we're mindful of him, uh, made a little lower than angels, but in, but in essence, in eternity, Jesus is higher than, uh, and again, Jesus the Creator, therefore Jesus created the angels. Um, and and we, we, we can talk about that if you, if you have some specific questions on that. Uh, Jesus is firstborn, that is the first begotten of, of God, John 3, 16, uh, who receives worship from angels, that angels are required to worship the Son of God uh, because of who he is, and all beings are inferior to the Son, and thus must, must worship him. And so, and, and as, as well as we, so all humans and all angels, and that's what got Satan in trouble. Satan is a created being and he didn't want to worship God, uh, uh, the son or, or, or the Godhead, let me say it that way. And, uh, and as a result, he was uh, thrown out of heaven because of the, of the pride that was found in him. But Jesus becomes uh, of the firstborn and therefore, um, uh, there in verse five, he says, "For unto, for unto whom I'm sorry, for unto which of the angels said he at any time?" And so, what 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 Paul is doing in in these verses, he is saying to the to the, to the Hebrew uh, listener, um, uh, he's better than angels because. At what time did God ever say to angels, uh, you are my son, I, I have begotten you, uh, uh, and again, I will be to him a father, and, and he shall be to my son? When, these are all questions. Notice the question mark uh, in, in verse 5. Uh, when did God ever say that? And he'll say, well, God never said that. That's because th the son, <laughs> Jesus is, <laughs> is higher than these angels, Okay. Because if, if God just wanted to send somebody from heaven on our behalf, would he have not sent an angel? And they believe in angels. So that's, that's, that's part of Paul's strategy. Uh, he's going to argue from a known condition and position. Okay. So if I already know what you already believe in. Then it behooves me to at least start there and try to move you to, to, to a new, to a higher place or, or to my point of view, 
by giving you from, 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 from knowing where you're starting from. And so, so they already start from the fact that angels exist. Okay? They were not like the Sadducees because the Sadducees did not believe in, in angelics or the spirit or life after death. The Pharisees did, but the, angel, but the Sadducees didn't. And so obviously these who had first come to Christianity uh, understood um, uh, uh, life after death, Jesus dying and, and being raised from the dead. But now they want to abandon all that. And he said, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't, don't, don't abandon Jesus because where are you going to go to? Well, we're going back to Moses. Well, you know, if you're going back to the previous system, Remember before Moses, there were the prophets. And before the prophets, there was the angels, okay? And let me tell you about the angels. At which time did God ever say to angels, you know, come over here and uh, I'm going, because you're my son. In verse six, uh, uh, again, he says, when he brought, uh, when he bringeth in the first begotten uh, into the world, he said, and let all the angels of God worship him. Um, there in, 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 in number two. Number three, uh, he is God. That God, that Jesus is part of the Godhead. Um, where he says um, 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 that, 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 that now uh, his work, now that Jesus' work has uh, been, been accomplished on earth, he is now enthroned and appointed but angels are merely servants. And as powerful creatures of God, angels conduct various services for the Lord. That's true. But like us, angels render worship to Christ. And again, that's going back to Revelation 5.13. Um, but, but Jesus, apart from being the son of God, Jesus is, is God the son the third member of the uh, second member of the Godhead, uh, as, as well as he being Lord, Jesus being Lord. Uh, um, here, I did not uh, uh, write this up, verse number, um, where, where, where he is Lord, that is Yahweh, who is the eternal creator. So as the son bears the image of the father or of his father in a natural state, uh, in a physical world, the son ought to look something like the father. And if he looked like his mama, that's no problem. But I mean, in most instances, there is a resemblance. Uh, he said, his argument is, Paul's argument is, so the son of God would bear the name of God the divine name of God, which is Yahweh. Uh, Jesus is morally superior to all other creatures because he is righteously, he is the right, he is righteousness incarnate uh, in flesh. Um, and uh, as, as a result of that, uh, he, Christ, is superior to uh, the angels in that regard. And then number, number, f uh, um, uh, the fifth way being uh, that uh, Jesus is sovereign. That is, he has been given permission uh, to sit down uh, at the right hand of God. There's a question he asks. Uh, I didn't mark it. Um, that he is, he being Christ, is sovereign, seated at the right hand of God. Angels are ministering spirits, uh, given the task to go and to uh, minister either through, through a word or to give uh, exaltation, power, um, uh, to lend uh, support and... Uh, um, um, to accomplish or to join forces with, uh, to give directions and, and, and guidance. Uh, we see that um, uh, uh, Joshua, remember when Joshua went out uh, the night before the big battle, 
and uh, ran into an angel. He wanted to know if y'all, you for us or for them? Because <laughs> this was a huge angel with a sword. And the angels, I'm for y'all, you know, we, we go, we gonna do this thing. Uh, or in the case of Daniel, when Daniel meets uh, uh, Gabriel, uh, seeking an answer to how long we're gonna be in captivity, you know, Gabriel uh, says to him to get up because, you know, he, uh, he fainted away, that Daniel fainted when he saw Gabriel. Uh, and then in the book of Jude, uh, there's also a reference that uh, while we were yet contending over the body of, of, of Moses, uh, you know, he had already sent uh, help and for 21 days were, were uh, prevented from coming because of the forces of evil. Satan himself stood against the angel of God, but uh, the angel over, uh, eventually had overcome was able to deliver his message. But there are ministering spirits. Angels are spirits that minister or administer, uh, rendering service on behalf of the Son for the benefit of the saints. And so uh, we, we see in Isaiah um, uh, uh, chapter 6, is it, uh, where the, the angels are because there are three classes of angels, by the way. Y'all know that. I'm not going to teach on angelics. Uh, uh, this, ain't, this is a lecture. <laughs> but I'm going to take a quick, quick, quick break right here and, uh, and ask uh, for questions. Uh, but, um, but in Isaiah, uh, well, that Isaiah 6, right, there are uh, various classes of angels. That some have two wings, some have six wings. Uh, and um, uh, some, some at the throne, some in other places within the kingdom of God uh, so that they can, uh, again, minister to, to God himself and for the benefit of God and the things going forward. Uh, let me stop here and uh, stop sharing for a moment. Let me, let me come down and see if there are any questions thus far. Oops, that's not, where am I at? Oh, here I be. Here I are. Okay. Um, so then, uh, comments or questions thus far? I know there's a whole lot uh, going on on chapter one uh, how do I get, how do I get big again? I can't, I don't know how to do that. Okay. All right. Comments or questions? Anybody? Um, so, so again, uh, as Paul makes argument and, and again, when I say argument, I'm talking from a legal standpoint for argument not not like what we do in how in our houses where we're arguing back and forth <laughs> an argument is a form of uh, uh philosophy whereby you present your defense you present your case and you argue your points it's, it's a form of rhetoric and um, um and then you as in debate you be quiet and let the other side uh, argue or present their side of the case. And then in this instance, the judge will, will make a determination of uh, who, who hit John or whatever. Um, and so it is in, uh, in, in, in rhetoric that uh, we make a presentation by um, uh, presenting the facts, uh, trying to get your uh, de denounce your opponent's um, uh, points. Uh, try to anticipate your po your opponent's uh, uh, points of view, and uh, and dispel them or or, or come up uh, come up with your own that will uh, bring doubt or or shed uh, disparity on them. Uh, but but Paul is making a conclusive presentational argument so as to convince them or persuade them not 
to abandon Christianity, but really to take them deeper into Christianity. So, so you and I who have no thoughts of leaving Christianity, it just reinforces our notion and knowledge of what Jesus Christ has already done for us going forward. Okay. Uh, anybody else? There was, a, there is a question in the chat. Brother Sherman, do you want to ask that question? You're on mute. Sorry. Uh, yeah, as Pastor, I guess going back to the comment you made about angels and their, I guess, mission and function. And now that uh, what Paul has emphasized is the fact that we, we have a person who is greater than angels. So in terms of uh, a lot of people like to communicate I feel like they communicate to angels. I guess my question is, do we still need to be in that crisis, our own mediator? Do we still need to communicate through angels to Christ? Or is that... Uh... Yeah, there is the uh, understanding that uh, we have uh, within the earth realm, you know, angels still uh, ministering. Uh, we we all supposed to have a quote-unquote guardian guardian angel, guardian angel. Um, and there are those, as, as Paul would say, that uh, some have entertained angels unaware, right. uh, not knowing that they have been talking to angels because we're looking for uh, somebody with a wing, with wings on, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we know the word angels can, is interpretation as a messenger. So it depends on how we are interpreting, interpreting the word angel in the context in which we're, we're seeing that. But I think in Paul's use of the phrase angels, unaware, uh, he is talking about heavenly or angelic beings that come down from heaven for the benefit of humanity. So yes, I, I believe in angels. I'm not a Sadducee. I still believe that angels uh, exist today, and uh, uh, we have seen some, and uh, we probably ignored more than we we have encountered. Uh, but uh, as Paul would tell us, be hospitable, because you don't know who you're talking to. Right. Amen to that. Anyone else? <clears throat> Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, because demons are spirits. So, you know, if you, and, and, and certainly to believe in God is also to believe in, in, in the demonic side of that. So you know that there's some demons. <laughs> there, there, are, there are evil forces in the world. Um, uh, not that everybody that does evil is a demon. Uh, but, uh, but there is the influence of and and the, uh, the using of people that bring about uh, uh, the evil things that are unfolding. And, uh, and I think to counter that, uh, certainly we have the Holy Spirit, but I think there are also uh, angels uh, that have been dispatched to the earth uh, for protection of his remnant and to, uh, to make sure that uh, uh, we stay within the boundaries of God's permitted, permissive will. He, we may not be doing, we may not be doing God's perfect will, but but I don't think God's going to allow anybody, whether we're talking forty-five or the next forty-six, uh, to 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 go beyond a certain limit without His uh, direct uh, intervention. Praise God. Okay. So, so what was your your answer? We don't. The question was, do we still need to communicate through angels? And my interpretation mm. of that was, do, does that mean we need to communicate with God through angels as opposed to Jesus or with Jesus through angels? So, right. Oh, no. We, you know, we, we're, praying, we're praying to God through, through Jesus Christ. Yes. Okay. Yeah, no, no. We don't, need, we don't have to pray through Michael or, or Gabriel. No angels. No, no, no. You can, go, you can come boldly before the throne right. of grace to obtain yes. mercy at a time of need. Now, if you want to say... That I that a, a deceased loved one of mine uh, has an angel. I ain't I ain't gonna, I ain't I ain't gonna say yes or no to that. But but if you do any talking to to the heavens, I would suggest you do it through through, <laughs> through God through Jesus Christ. Yeah. I know that works. Now I don't know about these angelic uh, conversations. Yeah. 
Okay. And, and, I, and, and as I was reading the question, my thought is, yes, angels are still, they still have that same assignment. They are ministering. They minister yes. to us. Yes. Um, yes. But, but our, our, con our connection to God is Jesus. Yeah. And there is nothing between us and Jesus. That's correct. That's, that's, that's how I read it. Okay. Not even another yeah. human. Not even, no, no one. Nothing. And, and, and that's for the Catholics that uh, think that they can only God get to God through, through the priest or the, or the father or whoever's in the uh, other side of the confessional booth. You know, you can take your, your confession straight to Jesus Christ. Amen. Anyone else? Outstanding. Um, let me see how to get back into this, uh, Jacqueline. Uh, okay, okay. You should be able to just go back to yes. Thank okay. Uh, so now uh, uh, Paul makes presentation that Jesus is superior to the angels in three specific ways. Um, here through verses four through seven. Uh, in his relationship, uh, Jesus' relationship with the Father. The Father here declares Jesus to be his unique son. And Paul is asking the questions here in four, uh, specifically in, in, in verse five, uh, for under which of the angels said he at any time, thou art my son. When the son took on human nature, uh, and, and endured the death for sin, rose from the dead victoriously, and ascended into heaven, Jesus then inherited a name that no angel has the right uh, to bear, and that is the, the worthy Lamb of God. He is the Son of God who now has become, um, he, he, what, what they say in Philippians 2, uh, through a process in, in Greek called kenosis, that he uh, limited himself uh, uh, so that he could become a uh, human form. Jesus, it, it's, it's emptied, it's the, it's the Greek word for empty. Uh, he emptied himself uh, and became um, a subject to sin and to death so that he might please the Father out of Isaiah 53, it pleased the Father to bruise him uh, for our, our sins and iniquities, okay? Um, uh, not only in relationship, but also in his reign, in Christ's reign, he is superior to, to the angels. Uh, we see this uh, starting in verse 10, that uh, verse 10 says, and and thou, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hand. Um, and that, I'm sorry, starting in, yeah, eight and nine. Let me go back to eight and eight first. Uh, but unto the Son, he said, Thou throne, O God, is forever and ever a sepulcher of righteousness, is the sepulcher of thy kingdom. And so he will have the rule and the reign uh, as King of Kings and Lord of Lords uh, in the uh, in the world to come. Christ shall be be that, uh, and he will have a righteous reign. And we, who are um, uh, uh, who is his servants now, will rule and reign with him. Uh, we will rule over the angels. I hear what you're saying. I said, wait a minute, is there slavery in heaven? No, you know, the, 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 the hierarchy of uh, master servant, uh, Lord to, 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 to servant, we are, we're servants of God. Um, so this is not a master slave relationship, but more of a fellowship relationship where uh, we will rule and reign with uh, Christ and uh, have the angel, angels uh, under our charge, uh, even in, in as much as we've made a little lower than them, but at some point we're going to be exalted above the angels 
when we take on the personage uh, in the image of Jesus Christ. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but when we see him, we're going to be likened under Christ and therefore have uh, the same ruling and reigning authority as Jesus Christ. Uh, so it's not only a righteous reign, but it's an eternal reign, uh, reign uh, as sovereign. Uh, even though everything is, uh, everything in creation is subject to growing old and wearing out like a garment of clothing, Jesus as the God-man will never perish. Uh, and we see that uh, uh, in verse 11, he said, they shall perish, but thy uh, remaineth, and they all shall wax old as do a garment, okay? But Christ will reign forever, uh, and as a vesture uh, shall thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, And but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Uh, we will be with him uh, in a righteous and eternal uh, reign in glory. And so as God, Christ is eternal, and he has no beginning, and he will have no end, uh, will not perish, will not vanish, will not fall, will not fail. Uh, and so we have a relationship. Uh, we also have a, a, a reign and there's also a reward. And here Christ's superiority being over the angels that the Father has promised to make Jesus's enemies his footstool. We see that in verses 13 and 14, where the text says that God has, uh, has, uh, has never said to any of those angels, uh, where's the question here? In verse 13, he says, but to which of the angels said, God, he, at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Well, God never said that to an angel. He said that to his son, Jesus Christ, is what Paul's the argument, and he's bringing that knowledge and that, that as a reminder uh, to, 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 to the listener or to the, to the reader of this, of this text. And, and that's an Old Testament. We're gonna, find, we're gonna go back and see that here in a moment. And so he's saying to them, uh, uh, at which time did God ever say to an angel, you know, I'm going to make your enemies your footstool? No, no, he, no, he's not saying that to an angel. He's saying it to his son because his son is superior to those angels. And so when we look at the references that Paul uses as a basis of his argument, if we look at verse 5, uh, uh, again, for unto which of the angels said he at any time, again, that's a a reoccurring theme in this first chapter, thou art my son, he's going to go back and quote for them uh, Psalms 2, uh, verse 7. He says, uh, he says, I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And so by interspersing throughout this letter, um, scriptural text from the, from the Old Testament, uh, Paul is laying a foundation by which if they want to argue, they're going to have to argue with the text. <laughs> Paul said, don't, don't argue with me, argue, argue with the Bible, argue on this, this, this particular incident, argue with Hebrew scripture, because this is what the text says, and we have, re, we have venerated our scriptures and, and the Psalms and, and the prophets in our Hebrew text, that these things are, are true to our hearts and minds. And so Paul pulls those verses in, this one coming out of Psalms 2-7, he pulls one out of 2 Samuel chapter 7, again, with the same theme, uh, Father, Son. He says, I will be his father and he shall be my son if he commits iniquities, I will chasten him with the rod of man and with the stripes of the children of men. And again, we know that the exact reference is speaking to, um, uh, in the time of uh, Samuel, the, the, the king, etc. Uh, but certainly that is applicable to what God has done for, him, for his own son. 
He says, I will be his father and he's going to be my son. In verse six, we see uh, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he says, uh, and let all the angels of God worship him. And so he just calls in Psalms 97, verse 7, where it says, confronted by all that, I'm sorry, all they that serve graven image, that boast themselves of idols, he says, worship him, all ye gods. So everything ought to worship uh, him, that is the God uh, that, that the Lord has uh, set up uh, for human understanding. And in this instance, it is our Christ, the Messiah, to whom we shall worship. Uh, not graven images, not those things that are idols, but rather he that God has himself set up as our uh, object of worship. Uh, in verse 7, it says, the angel said, who made his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Uh, Paul is quoting out of Psalms chapter, uh, uh, Psalms 104, uh, verse 4, uh, who says, who makes his angels spirits, his ministers a flaming fire. Almost a direct quote uh, going from one translation in the old to this uh, one here we find in the New Testament. Verses 8 and 9, again, he's making references of Jesus being more, uh, being superior to the angels. Uh, in verses 8 and 9 is a quote from Psalms 46, I'm sorry, Psalms 45, verses 6 and 7. He says, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the sceptre of thy kingdom is a right sceptre. Thou loveth righteousness and hateth wickedness. Therefore, God, thy God, has appointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Um, and we see that here in, in, in that same verse. Verse eight, a, a sepulchre of righteousness is a sepulchre of thy kingdom. Almost a word for word quote going, going forward. And then in verses uh, 10 and through 12, there's a quote coming from Psalms 102, verses 25 through 27. He says, of old has thou laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the works of thy hands. They shall perish but thou shall endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment, as a vesture shall thou change them, and, uh, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. And again, we see that right there uh, in, uh, in verses uh, 10 through 12, Paul using Old Testament scripture to uh, make his case for uh, Jesus being superior to uh, to the angels. And then finally, uh, we see that at the very end, uh, verse 13, uh, quoting from Psalms 110, 110, verse 1, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And there it is uh, here. Uh, together. And so as those uh, uh, writers, I'm sorry, as, as the readers uh, and the listeners to this letter would have been able to make those mental uh, connections, uh, they would have been familiar with the word and the phrases. Uh, they said, that's Old Testament. That's, that's, that's what David said. That's what his second Samuel said that, et cetera, et cetera. They would have uh, been able to uh, make that connection a little, a little more readily, uh, redder, readlier than you and I, uh, quicker than you and I, uh, because they would have been raised up on Old Testament scripture. And so Paul uses that as the basis of his arguments going forward. Christ has a more excellent name than the angels because through his suffering and death, Christ acquired a greater inheritance 
greater in his character, in his work, and certainly in his ministry. Christ stands superior to those that have come before him. And through his gracious kingdom or glorious kingdom, uh, though his glorious kingdom is not seen on earth today, Christ has still been enthroned, amen, as king and will return one day to establish righteousness on the earth. Now we say that Christ uh, at this point uh, is in his priest ro uh, role in heaven. He is uh, seated on the right hand side of God uh, as our high priest in the heavenly places making intercessory for us. He's always going to be king uh, and he's going to bring in the Melchizedek uh, priest and king uh, motif as a uh, way of defining uh, Jesus Christ's personality uh, and his interaction with Abraham, certainly his interaction uh, on our behalf going forward. But yes, you can, you can call Jesus Christ king now and say, well, we well, can't be king because we ain't crowned him yet. Well, uh, you know, even though the king ain't wearing his crown, a real king don't need a crown to know that he is a king. But, uh, but if you think that you got, you, you, you got to wait for the day of coronation, uh, he was king when he came here. Amen. That's what the three wise men understood that this is a, this is a, where is the king of the Jews? And Herod got mad. He said, well, I'm here, right here. What y'all looking for me? No, 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 no. We, we're looking for a little, uh, he's a little child uh, born. Uh, we've been following his star. And when, when, when Herod got that, Herod became like 45. He became incensed. He became outrageous. He became megalomania. He, he started killing folk killing all them little babies uh, uh, going forward. But, but Christ is enthroned. Yes, we will crown him King of King and Lord of Lords, even though he is already those things for us. And so when we look at chapter one and prepare ourselves for chapter two, because that's uh, like I said, there's some bleed over. There's going to be some bleed over into chapter, chapter two. Um, and uh and uh i need to i'm just checking a quick reference here that uh, uh da -da -da -da. chapter two is going to take us And the glass holder of the Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so so what is it? What is our takeaway from from chapter one? What what is the the applications that we are to be uh, aware of. God's angelic servants, uh, we are intrigued by, uh, by their ministry uh, and certainly by their power and their authority, but only God's word can enlighten us, okay? Um, uh, even the word of God is, 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 is going to outlast the angels of God because um, uh, God's word is, is going to last forever. And so, so, so we need to get into the word uh, that, 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 that nothing replaces the mind of God. The word of God is the mind of God. And once we embrace the word of God, we are able to at least uh, begin to uh, recognize the mind of God or the will of God. Uh, so that we can do the work of God, uh, but you, we will never we will never start the work if we don't understand God's will, and we'll never understand God's will until we begin to embrace God's word. And so the three are interrelated, interacting one with another. But the, but Jesus is the word of God, the living 
embodiment of the word of God. And so what Paul wants us to take away from this is that the Logos, Jesus is the word. In the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. The same was in the beginning uh, with God, that we would be enlightened by this word. God has spoken directly to us uh, in his, by his written word. And, and so uh, Paul was instrumental in that. Uh, uh, Matthew and, 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 uh, uh, was, was an apostle that wrote. John is an apostle that wrote for us. M Mark and, and Luke were, uh, were uh, the disciples of uh, uh, other apostles. Uh, Mark with uh, Peter and uh, Luke, no doubt, had a relationship with, uh, uh, might have had a relationship with John and later with Paul. Uh, yeah, Luke had a relationship with Paul writing um, Luke and Acts. Uh, but, but we don't have, we don't need the, the prophets anymore. No, I'm sorry, we, we don't, we, we don't uh, depend on, on, on the prophets uh, as our only source. We have the, the word of God. Uh, it, it is the inspired word of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instructions in righteousness as we have now received it. That's our application. And therefore, God has also sent us not only uh, the, the spoken word uh, that is recorded in, in the Old Testament, but we now have the recorded word uh, sent to us by his son, the word incarnate in flesh, to whom the written word points and who points us back to the written word. And, and so as the word, uh, as the living word, Jesus Christ as the living word uh, helps us to understand uh, the written word through the power of the Holy Spirit that enlightens. And therefore the Son of God alone then, then is the source of life as well as the savior of our lives. Not only that, but God's, the application is that we would take away from this, Jesus superior to the angels, that God's angelic servants minister to us, but only God's spirit can minister in us. Um, and, uh, and, and, and it's the inwardness or the indwelling that you and I need to embrace. We need to get up under the word. We need to get in the word. The word got to get in us. So just because they are spirit beings, angels should not be uh, confused with the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, and, and thank God for angels, but give me the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I need the Holy Ghost, the spirit of the living God, living and abiding down on the inside. That is my transformative power. And I would to God that it was a once and for all, I'd be good to go and don't have to, uh, but, but it's a progressive work. It's an ongoing work. The transformation of our minds has to be ongoing. You cannot get it once and you say, I'm done. Uh, this thing don't work like that. You got to keep on getting it. Uh, until the day you die, you will never ever get enough of the Holy Ghost where you are now have inexhaustibly, inexhaustibly uh, consumed the Holy Ghost. You can never get it all. Amen. But you ought to be hungering and thirsting after righteousness. I don't have a problem with angels, but I, but I, but don't take your spirit from me. I'm like, I'm like Daniel now. I'm like, I'm like Samson now. Lord, don't take your spirit. Uh, because I'm, 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 I'm definitely going to fail. I'm going to already have problems in, in, in staying, staying up and being up and not falling. But, but if you take the Holy Ghost, I'm surely going to fall. I'm going to fail this thing. And so the Holy Spirit then is the paraclete, uh, the comforter, he that comes alongside of us uh, to help us. And uh, yes, they're ministering spirits. Angels are but he, they can only minister to us and empower us to enable us to do something for that moment and they gone, they go back to heaven. But the Holy Ghost stays with us. He stays right 
with us. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And I know that it is the spirit of the Lord. Uh, stay here with us, uh, um, leading us and guiding us so that we do not become uh, a, a, alone and abandoned in this cruel world. Yes, angels exist. And yes, they minister on our behalf but they too are subject to the Son of God. Amen. Every knee is going to bow. The word every means all, y'all. Amen. Angels, uh, dogs, camels, anything that has a knee. Amen. I remember a friend of mine, he says, he says, he said, even my dog is going to talk. He said, what are you talking about? He said, he's got a tongue, don't he? He said, every tongue going to fat. What's your dog going to say? The dog, my dog going to say, Jesus is Lord. That's what the Bible say he's going to say. You, you going to say it because you got a tongue. My dog going to have to say it because my dog has a tongue. I say, well, that's literal. He said, well, I'm going to take it literal until, it, until I learn it otherwise. Amen. And so angels are going to bow before him. We even said that in one of the songs. Angels bow before him. Heaven on earth, uh, heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God. We said, well, y'all know the words. Y'all, I'm, I'm, I'm. It's getting late in the day. What is my applications for this, Reverend? What are you, what are you, trying, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to tell you that, and, that God's angelic servants protects us physically, but only the Son of God, amen, can save us spiritually. That is the one who is to occupy the throne of our lives is Jesus Christ. Is he on the throne? Have you, have you cleared out the throne room with all that garbage you got in there, you're like a hoarder. You have, you, have, you have saved up all that trash, all that stuff from the years past, amen. You still got your boogie shoes in there. You still got your platform shoe. You need to get all that stuff up out of there, amen, and clear that throne room so that Jesus can come on in and sit down and take control. Both the Old Testament prophets and angels desired to see the spiritual salvation through the Son of God that we have experienced in our own lives. Amen. They long to see what you and I have now, have past tense saw. Amen. When he, get to, when he gets to Hebrews 11 and, and take that walk down the uh, hall of faith, amen, he's going to tell you they kept the faith on, uh, not, not knowing that they would not see that day, knowing that, uh, that their hope was way down the road, but they kept the faith and their hope because one day they, they, they knew that on the other side that they will see. You and I are on that other side of the cross. We have seen, amen, the, the death of uh, the cross in, in our understanding. We have, we have experienced, amen, the revelation of God uh, taking us from where we were as sinners and have brought us forward, amen. We have longed, they, they Old Testament saints have longed, amen, to be and see what you and I have experienced on this side of, of, of salvation. It's been 2,000 years, and there's, there may be another 2,000 years uh, uh, going for, forward. So we should acknowledge in thought, word, and deed that Jesus Christ is superior to all things in person as well as in work. Uh, that, 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 that who he is in, in his pers personification and, and the works that he has accomplished on our behalf, the miracles, the, the signs, the wonders, uh, and certainly the greatest of, of that being uh, his resurrection from the dead, all of those things are, are superior to whatever else might uh, come forward uh, or, or before us as an argument that we ought to leave Jesus alone and go back to whatever else we had. Never. I will never turn back. Amen. I will never give up. Amen. I am fully persuaded. I am thoroughly convinced. I am unapologetically, amen, uh, 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 running this race. And before I take it back, amen, I'll add more to it. Isn't that all right? Amen. <laughs> God bless all of you. Amen. Oh, my goodness. Uh, that, should, that should say the night. What? 16. 
I should say the uh, next class is on the 16th. I'm sorry. Yeah, so the next class is on the 16th, y'all. And uh, we're going to get into chapter two. Uh, again, I like to refer back to King James, but, uh, but uh, and the text will be in King James. Uh, so at least uh, run through King James. But if you use a different, uh, a, a, at least in two other virgins, versions, uh, NIV is okay, uh, Chris, uh, 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 contemporary English, or the New Revived Standard Version, New King James, any of those would, uh, uh, would suffice going forward. Um, Jacqueline, uh, go ahead and uh, un, uh, unmute everybody. Let me, let me get out of here. Um, 